All right, hey audiences, welcome to another Q&A for the 25th Annual San Francisco Independent Film Festival uh, 2023. Today we're fortunate to have filmmakers and actors with us from Salesman. Uh, what's the complete title of this film? Salesman and the Nine Circles of Corporate Hell, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Hey, Gabriel, since you spoke first on my screen, can you just uh, say hi what your role was for audiences? In case you need hi, to know? Uh, I'm Gabriel Gazul. I'm the writer, director, and editor of uh, Salesman and the Nine Circles of Corporate Health. Cool. And Nikki, how about you next? Yeah, my name is Nikki Leidecker, and I'm the producer of Salesman. And last but not least, Frederick. Hey there, <laughs> uh, Fred Maskey. I'm the salesman. All right. So... How did this movie come to be? What was the inspiration? Uh, right, you're the writer director, right, Gabriel? Yes. Yeah. Where did um, it come from? The uh, I mean, originally it come from uh, the idea. The original idea had come from a friend, a cousin of mine that wanted to get on The Apprentice, and so he, ha he had asked me to do a, a videotape for him so he could submit. And one of the things that he and what he do, did for a living was he was a salesman. And when I was asking him questions, I guess part of the interview. I'd asked him, like, well, what do you sell? And he gave me the, the line of being a salesman isn't about what you're selling. It's about who you're selling it to. The product doesn't matter. If you're a real salesman, you can sell anything to anyone because that's what the, the thing is. And that always stuck with me. And I love the idea of a salesman kind of going on a journey and using their own, you know, tricks of the trade to kind of get through things. But I never quite knew what that journey was. And then I kind of stumbled upon... Um, I never read The Inferno before by Dante. So when I was reading it, I was just like, it kind of clicked together of like, oh, this could be a road movie about a salesman that has to travel through hell and use all of his wits about him as one as one does to make the sale. Right. You get through to make one final sale at the end of in the through the ninth level of hell. And from there, it just kind of like it kind of took on a life of its own. And yeah, yeah, we think it works well. It works well for sure. Um, have Have you ever been? You, you have you been in corporate America? Yeah, actually, okay. uh, that's uh, that's my my main job is being in uh, the corporate world. Yeah. So, are you not a full time filmmaker? Uh, well, I try. I and we do make film as much as we can. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it doesn't pay as much for the bills, so kind of have to have the job. Uh, but right. it's funny that the the job does inform all the filmmaking. Yeah, well, we'll talk more about that, but I want to hear how also, Nikki, what's your role and how did you come on board with this project? Uh, yes, yeah, so I've produced uh, Gabe's other short films, and yeah. that's also how we had met Fred, because Fred was in one of our shorts, The Russian, and we just really liked working with him, and so we kind of put him in all of our projects. Um, and this project was interesting to me because it kind of reminded me a lot of like Monty Python and the meaning of life. It was all these kind of like short skits that work together right. as one whole. Right. And it seemed really super challenging, all the different levels and getting all the cast and locations. And so that's what drew me to the project. Were you were you um, participating, if you will, in the writing, the creating of the script at all? Like did uh, Gabriel come to you and say, hey, see how this is coming, this draft? Yeah, I um he would use me as like his sounding board because I had never read The Inferno. So it was like, okay, if someone with no knowledge of this does this sound too confusing? Are you like, I would help him kind of simplify it for so that everybody could understand and it wouldn't be so in the know because right. not a lot of people have read that, I don't think. Yeah, I, I haven't read it. I'm aware of it. I you know, know about it. I also you know, really haven't worked in corporate America, but I know it, you know, just like I know Dante's Inferno. Um, so uh, it captured both those really well. Uh, Frederick, how did you come? I know they're, they've worked with you before, but how did you get involved? Um, you know, it's kind of like the, the whole actor's dream. Gabe approaches me and throws a, a script in my lap and says, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> you want to do it? <laughs> it? It wasn't quite exactly like that, but like, um, yeah, I, and, and it's, can't say no to it. I mean, it's a, it's a dream job. Gabe, did you, did you write with actors in mind by any chance or? Yeah. You? I, I Fred, I think was, you know, we had worked with him on several other shorts and I just really liked working with him and I thought he was great. You know, you know, his whole presence, his comedic timing, you know, everything about everything that Fred has, you know, worked with this. And also, um, you know, like, you know, one could have, I could have tried with other actors, but I think the other thing that really helped a lot was that Fred had such a willingness to be a part of this um, kind of experimental way of making it. 
because we made we shot this over i think the we were actually looking at this up the other day nikki of like when was the first day that we filmed it was and, in june of 2013 so yeah. so when we came project. to fred we were like we don't know how often we're going to get to shoot we don't know when we're going to get to shoot uh, but when we do we'll need you um and are you up for it? and he went absolutely and it took 10 years from when we first started writing it to when we wrapped it um and wow. throughout that entire time it would be like he would get a he, he may not hear from us for like six months and then he'd get a call and go i've got a, we're going to shoot the next level we're going to do uh, level five and send him a script and he'd be like great and we would talk about it um he would give us suggestions of what he would you know what could be different on, on it and so yeah so a lot of it was that the process of he was very much a partner in this that yeah, for for sure. a project that lasted oh, nearly a decade uh very generous of you frederick <laughs> it, it just fit my schedule it was fine yeah. and luckily you didn't age it all or change it all because you know you look <laughs> shot it all in the same month might have a few more wisdom hairs but uh you know well fred yeah. knew like the exact way to grow his beard to where it was in the movie so he knew how yeah. many days to get it to the exact look yeah. whenever we would film over the years <laughs> it truly it truly did look like you shot it all at once i mean i i was not joking when it like it looks like you know it was made all in say two weeks um what were the challenges of the the how long were the gaps of filming um some of them were as far as years Wow. Um, in between them um so we would usually shoot one i think about once a year or twice a year we would shoot them but some of the continuity it wasn't shot in order and mm -hmm. so there are some parts where someone will literally walk through a door and when they go in the door on one side it's i think 2015 and when they came out the other side it was 2018 um and like you said like one of the compliments is if you don't notice that and that's great that you didn't realize that literally between this step and this step or even jumping over the sticks was I think a four year gap um, between wow. when he when he landed from when he took off. But, but it, it, it works perfectly because he's in a different time, right? Different universe, yeah. different space, whatever. Um, yeah. uh, creative use of um, the different chapters of the circles of hell too uh, made me chuckle multiple times. How did you come up with the humor for each of those? Like the first one's cats or watching cats. like. Uh, you know, I don't know. Just talk about those. Yeah, I think that what uh, what we were trying to get to to do is um, try to hit every part of where we're at. You know, from the the corporate side of things, like from HR to you know how how we're kind of how sometimes we can feel trapped in our jobs, and so just every single aspect that I could find of that that I could just mine in my own life or Nikki's life or even you know with Fred as well of that we could that we could throw in there anything that could just come up that we feel like was a way to, that traps people that kind of keeps them in their own circle or then they're on their own hamster wheel was something that we wanted to go with. Um, and so the, the challenge was that each time was you had to show who were the sinners here, what was their punishment, what did Fred want from them or the salesman want from them, and how could he use whatever technique, whatever sales technique to get that from them that also reflects what their punishment is. So you know, and it's not always, it's not, it doesn't always quite, quite fit neatly in it, but that, those were the challenges it came to. And so you could just take any level of any corporation, any department, marketing, HR, accounting, whatever it might be. And as long as you could fit it into there, because since there was no rules and each one could be shot differently, you could be in a white void for one, or you could be out on a bridge in the middle of Culver City on another, and it would still work. So it, it both freed us up to do whatever we wanted but it also made it um where then you could kind of because when you have a blank slate you're like well, well what could we do yeah. um because you have to start somewhere um yeah. and then you know like nikki was saying it, it was very it was very helpful when she would go like yeah no one's gonna get that and i'll be like oh well it makes sense to me but i understand an audience may not right. may not appreciate it sometimes yeah, the use of your imagination, all these clever little, uh, you know, chapters made it accessible, at least for me, and, and, and entertaining, you know, it was, it was, it was a hoot. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, did you guys, uh, uh, Fred and uh, Nikki, recognize, are you in corporate America? I guess I'm, I am at the moment, like, you know, we, survival job here is, is pretty much mandatory, especially the last few years, and, uh, uh it is kind of it is yeah i'm i'm i kind of feel like i'm i'm relating way too much to the salesman and the script right now just having these little daily challenges where i have to 
overcome ridiculous, stupid obstacles and, and, you know, um, uh, you know, I'm just delivering things for, for corporate America. Yeah. And so I get to see it. I guess my side of it is, you know, from this end of the app and then, okay, this is what I'm doing next. Yeah. And then I go do that thing. And then whatever can fall apart and, and go wrong along the way, uh, <laughs> you hope to avoid. But, and there's, there's even excellent commentary, like on the suburbs, you know, where you get lost for your car or yes. the, the marketing department where, I mean, I, I, that was almost haunting. It was funny. And then like, oh my God, the commercial, I can't mute the commercials because I want to watch them. You know, I'm hearing all the commercial log lines in that yeah. scene. Uh, just wonderful stuff. Um, Nikki, what'd you think about the capturing kind of the corporate hell? <laughs> yeah, no, I was myself, I've been working in entertainment a long time, tech a long time. It's always been on the corporate end, even with production, um, because you work for a network. So it all, you know, it's all corporate. So yeah, it's, and it's helpful because a lot of, was able to secure a lot of locations that way through people that I knew in contact. So it was, uh, it was good. Yeah, the locations to get a little uh, filmmaking nerdy here. The locations were great. Um, you know, you had multiple locations. It felt like a bigger movie, maybe than the budget allowed. But you really had a lot of great locations. Did you acquire those through your contacts? Yeah. Yeah. Almost all of them. Yeah, and um, and through people that Gabe knew as well that worked in corporate. Um, and so you know, you become friends with the facilities team, and they know the facilities team that runs the whole office building and so we're able to get some really cool shots of like in those office building lobbies and elevator bays that you normally don't have access to unless you're a huge production with a ton of money so yeah we were able so to, pull you have to you have to shoot on weekends or late nights or weekends yeah we would do it weekends yeah. or late nights it just depended and then what about the opening and closing of the movie what is that location it looks like an amusement park if you will yeah, one, uh, some people we know, um, their parents have this ranch off the freeway here in LA, and they have big parties. And those little, um, like, casitas are where the guests stay and spend the night with the party. And then they actually have, like, a big dance floor, and that's a bar. So, like, they kind of envisioned this little town, and they built that. Um, so and they, we were able to just randomly find it through a friend. <laughs> It's not open to the public. It's just, no. a, someone's, wow. Yeah. It, it looked like you guys, it's wonderful. It looked like you built it for the movie. Uh, and it's so bizarre and strange. And it's a great way that you open and close. Yeah, it's thing. beautiful. We, we're very lucky. Very lucky. Um, and then uh, how did it uh, help you with your uh, character and your, um, you know, performance, uh, Fred, uh, having all these different wonderful locations? Boy, it, it, it really is it made it such a big world. I mean, you know, when we were out there on the, on those uh, flats, that was just kind of surreal. And that was, that was such an amazing shooting day because the wind was so, um, so strong and every, you know, it's like in between shots, all the actors are jumping into that little car to warm up and <laughs> you know, was have our, so how many things blew away like a mile away? <laughs> On that shooting day from the wind, uh, people Where was that? After. anyway, it's it's it. Um, I don't know. It's a little bit of a tangent, but it's just like it really did, like uh, make make the world more a little more surreal and, yeah. and um, tapping into that that weirdness of everything and just if I'm hearing things and where where were those flats? Where was that? Was that Apple Is Valley? It, yeah, it's a dry lake bed outside of Victorville. So it looked really challenging, like Fred said, things blown away, cold, wind. Um, I mean, it looked like you guys were, you know, having a challenge. Was that the most challenging day? Or what other challenges do you have uh, with this movie, making this movie? Nikki, you want to take that one? No, I mean, that was a challenging day. It was really cold. Like, it was funny. We were there, scouted out a couple of weeks, and it was, like, gorgeous weather, nice and warm. And then what, as soon as we started shooting, like, the wind kicked up, and it was freezing people were really cold <laughs> and then you have to direct people to find it because once you can find the dry lake but then you have to drive out onto the dry lake but to find where we are uh -huh. um so yeah that was pretty challenging and then there was that that day in kern county yeah yeah we're out in the desert um 
uh, we filmed at a location out in Long Beach. And I used to say like LA traffic can be challenging. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> things I mean, like that. Was... Moving in general is challenging, right? Let alone yeah. the, the way you guys had to approach it. The, the, the lake bed, though, is it's a good example of that. One of the things I, I learned making this was that trying to embrace the challenge of it, because even when we shot that day, like Nikki said, that when we scouted it, there wasn't even a breeze. It was just perfectly still. We're like, oh, perfect. We can just set up right behind the camera. We'll have the cars there and then we just shoot here and we'll be fine. And then we got there. It was like, I mean, the winds, we couldn't even put up a craft services table because it blew the table over yeah. um, and just knocked everything down. So and at first we were, I was thinking, well, maybe we should cancel it. And our unit production manager, Brent, was like, no, this is wonderful. Look how their, their clothes are moving. Look how, you know, they're all like squinting against the, the breeze, how it feels like there's this punishing uh, territory that they're in. Like, you can't buy that. Yeah. And it could, did give me a lesson of like, no, like we're there, we're doing it. And there might be a bit of a challenge, but how can we use this and like bring it into us? And that then informed the entire sound because yeah. all the... We had thought the audio was ruined, uh, but we have a miracle worker for a sound designer who made who saved all the audio and then added in wind to actually fit with all of the movement of the 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 clothes. And so now it gives it this entire like you know torrential feel that we could have never had. We'd have to spend millions of dollars to accomplish that. And it was we thought it was bad weather, and it was actually a real blessing. Yeah, we didn't have to do any ADR for that scene. Like, that was my next was, question. That's yeah. amazing. Surprisingly, yeah, he's he's really a miracle worker, Matt. Matt Hayes. Wow. Well, uh, you know, wow, fantastic. And, you know, it adds to it so much, right? It's like uh, just this whole other, like you said, um, larger production value. Um, uh, and then also that one scene, which, you know, it, it just, um, you ran out of money scene. Uh, what, that, what, what, what scene was that? That was the, the dance yeah. number, it was supposed to be the dance number. What was yeah. that chapter? That was a fifth level, okay. um, and that and that actually wasn't a, a lie. Actually, we did um, we we actually did write a song for it. Um, we did talk to people about puppets. We had puppets actually designed for it, and it was literally a thing of that the cost that it would be to have a, a giant dance number with puppets was just a little too difficult. It was a little too far out of our range. It was that exceeded our grasp, and at that point, we needed to wrap up because we needed to kind of like finish the film. Um, so we just kind of went down a, uh, a, a Monty Python uh, thing of a, you know, oh, we ran out of money. Sorry. It's kind of like a, in the Holy Grail when they're like, you know, we we we, we yeah, couldn't yeah. do the right. scene, but they just went into the cave and they got died. And, not, and then they just cut and suddenly several people are gone. So we're like, that worked for them. Let's work for this. But we actually did. We did write a song. We did have a composer put one together and uh, we did design puppets for it. It just never worked out how to actually get it get happening. So maybe in a future movie, I'll. I'll, I'll use that uh, it, it, it's kind of like back to your last answer too just kind of going with the flow and being open-minded to the challenges and maybe yeah. incorporating them and uh i think you probably got more out of that because of the monty python approach with not having money and using the text uh the manservants of mammon right yeah, that was, that was it. It. um and yeah just wonderful uh what other influences uh brought you to this kind of film what what influences you for making this film um, the one, the other one that I think was a bigger influence, a big influence for it was a, uh, um, it was, and it was during when I was just reading the, the Inferno for the first time was a uh, uh, Godard's Weekend, oh, okay. um, which because I, I, I love the fact that it was, it, you, it was very um, uh, episodic, but mm -hmm. at the same time it kind of all fits into its own whole, and because of that it could kind of have its own logic in and of itself, and even though to that degree for that film it was, it's more satirical and dramatic in its use of it. Um, I was like, but you could use that. And it does kind of come across as, oh, well, this could be a mix of like a use of sketch comedy, but mm -hmm. you could also push it to a more dramatic side of things. And so it didn't have to have a linear three act structure, you know, that had to flow through it as long as you just had as long as Fred's uh, um, performance was on point, which it always was, that holds the movie together. So we're always with him and he's always the one that kind of like brings it together. So you can have any ridiculous, crazy thing go on, and he's the grounding. He's the grounding force that keeps the entire film together. Right, right. Uh, and did you, um, uh, Frederick, kind of relate to this character at all? Uh, I know you kind of maybe do now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's and it's really, I don't know. It's weird. Uh, I, I should. 
I just feel like it feels like that all the time. And it's, it's partially because it's just, uh, that's the core of the theme is like, this is the modern hell where corporations are people. Yeah. And um, <laughs> they're taking over, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. Well, in that, in that fifth circle too, I mean, all the things you put up on the, the screen with text, you know, that you could discuss, you know, uh, wage disparity, the recession, wealth gap, inequality, you know, um, this movie could be kind of interpreted at a higher level if you want, right? It's kind of a nice allegory or, or you know, terrible to all the other woes going on in Absolutely. the workforce. Absolutely. So we could even go deeper if we want to, but that might be boring. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it reminds me also, there's a film, uh, what's the story with the Coen brothers, the, the, the cowboy, he goes, and there's different chapters, so oh, I shouldn't even bring this up because I can't remember the name of it. But it reminds me, it's a compliment to, to this film and your film. Um, uh, well, I forget, but the different chapters definitely have messages. I want to show it to my corporate friends. Oh, great. You know, uh, yeah, they'll be good for your movie, too. Absolutely. Uh, I, I Absolutely. think I think this could have a wide audience, in my opinion. I, I would you know we would love that. I think that that's, uh, you know, we we you're you're right in that, you know, there there is so much uh, one could have many a discussion on it, and it could be a very much a jumping off point that someone could go much deeper with. But even if it's taken on just a superficial level, I, we, you know, the, the hope is that it makes someone laugh or, you know, just enjoy the the uniqueness of just going through the journey of it um, yeah. so that one doesn't necessarily have to feel like, oh, I, I didn't quite get the symbolism um, because, like, you know, Nikki was always there to be like, if, it, if, we, if we're not there on the symbolism side of things, it, it, it should at least be entertaining and make people laugh and cry and, you know, kind of go with that journey. And so that was that was largely the the uh, the. The, the hope for it. Yeah, I think you accomplished it, you know, and also you accomplished, you know, the, the comedy aspect because comedy is hard, right? If it, if it fails, you fail big. Yeah. Um, but you guys nailed it. And, and oh, uh, yeah, and credit to Fred too and your casting. And Fred, I thank think you. you're wonderful in this role. It's like, um, it was with you all the way. Thank you. Yeah. I, did you, uh, did you, I, is I, it I, different I, for you to do this uh, film? What was it? Was it was it a different kind of film for you? Was this a different experience for you? Yeah, yeah, and I've had some really unique ones the last few years. I um, just uh, just kind of all over the place, and um, it feels like you know it's, it's like you can every one of them with each you know of the challenges like the the flats and and then the uh, the Kern County thing I mentioned before was like uh, we were you know getting shot at um, <laughs> while we were shooting. Um, and, uh, and it's like, okay, we're gonna adjust and we're not going to die today. We're gonna go film this next thing, but just um, um, lots of a variety of challenges. And then I, I just thought of what, what you were asking before about how I relate to the salesman. And it's interesting, it's, it's awkward. It's like, as an actor, you are constantly selling yourself and you have to be up to date with marketing and, every little you know gadget and aspect of of, of uh, promoting yourself and that's something that both me and my sister she's the uh, painter painted that <laughs> um you know we we have worked at festivals where she's selling her art and i'm selling my little things and it's just like that's that's the one awkward hard thing as act as a uh, artists of of any kind it can be really awkward and weird to sell yourself if you if you don't really know how and so it's like this just boils it down to it doesn't matter what you're selling and and uh, so yeah it's weird crossovers in in my life yeah um and there's so many favorite scenes here uh, another favorite scene is when fred you are uh, interacting with multiple ages of your son your character's son mm -hmm. at the corporate table um that's a that's a poignant and moving scene too. You, uh, even though it's clever, it's 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 very uh, you know poignant. Uh, talk about that a little bit. How how was that? That was probably the more serious moment for you, Fred. I'm on you right now. So how was that scene? Yeah, that that was another challenging one. Um, and yeah, just uh, flipping from, and that's really what I, you know, doing one level at a time whenever we could kind of disorients you and and uh, like even when I finally uh, watched it um, I was like oh oh that's the second level that we shot that so far back I did you know right. 
it's all out of order on the on the screen in, and in my brain. So that's, that's was there a challenge with the gaps connecting and staying in character? No, well, I, not really so much staying with the character, but just um, reorienting basically like before every take, it's like, who am I talking to now? When is this? And what part of my life or backstory um, is this referring to? Just like my kid at every age. And then all I'm concerned with is, is this, you know, kind of materialistic side of it. It's just like the most important thing is sell why can't you do that why aren't you making money that's what it's all about yeah and, and that's and to me what it's ultimately all about is freedom and and money is just the physical manifestation of freedom mm -hmm. and it's so easy to get caught up in just the material side of things in life and 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 doing whatever you're doing yeah, Let alone selling. <laughs> did, did, Gabriel, did you hope that that kind of message that Frederick just mentioned uh, comes across? Like, are you trying to uh, have audiences come away with a new outlook, if you will? Absolutely. I, I think that you know, you're, you're, you're Fred, Fred's absolutely right in that you know, money and you know, having that ability to uh, to have the freedom financially to not have a job or to be in a position where you wouldn't have to, you know. Do something that you wouldn't want to do that you could be able to you know you could sell whatever you would like however you would like it that's ultimately what gets you out of your own circle your own little trap to, you know the, your own little trap on it and you know i think that that it becomes harder and harder unless one is you know in a situation like that but i think ultimately if, if it just gives people a sense of like that you know just being able to relate to it makes them feel like they're may make them feel like they're not as alone in whatever thoughts they might think of, of like, I feel like I'm trapped. I feel like I'm going around in circles. I feel like I'm doing the same thing over and over again. I feel like I just can't get out of a certain rut um, that this gives them maybe a, a language that they can use that kind of makes them see of like, Oh, this is almost lampoonish and how I'm, I'm, I'm living my life that maybe there is a way to change because unlike those that are stuck in their circles in this movie, like, we do have the options to do those things. We can change things. We can make other choices. Whereas those in, in the hell here, that's the one thing they don't have is they don't get to choose where yeah. they're once they're there, you're stuck. You're either stuck in a small circle or one large one. Yeah. You don't, you don't ever get to get out. And that's what their hell is. It's funny. After watching this, I kind of had a sensation. I wanted to quit my corporate job, but I don't work. I don't have a corporate job. <laughs> uh, real quick, uh, I, like I said, I'm going to share this with corporate friends. The real quick, the, the it reminds me of um, the Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Or Scruggs. That's yeah. Know? I do know that film. Yeah, the, the structural way of it, which is a wonderful uh, show by the Coen Brothers. Your movie reminds me of that. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. That's a huge compliment. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, and was there any challenge uh, directing? Uh, you know, it was a smaller cast, but directing with such big gaps in time between, you know, shooting. Um, a lot of it was trying to f find um, what we could do. Like your imagination can run wild, but what you could do. But I think when it comes to specifically directing the actors, I think the, the challenge was sometimes I would just assume that they knew where they were at because I'm in my own headspace as to where this fits into the larger whole. And obviously, you know, they have their script that they they know kind of like the where they might be. But I think sometimes I might have made the assumption of like, oh, yeah, everybody understands exactly what's going on. It's like, well, yeah, and a little bit of a context of like, you know, having to I'd have to sit down with a friend and reorient myself in that saying like this happens before this. Remember when we shot this, that's going to happen after. Um, and where I might have made those assumptions, now I, I realize that that's, a, that's something that, you know, actors, you know, it, it helps them with it. It bring, really brings them onto it. Yeah. Um, so that was, the, oh, that was one of the challenges. I can't think of what other ones might have actually come up other than just the limitations of what we could and couldn't do. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, again, we would try to embrace that and go, okay, we can't have that. Can we imply it? Can we um, imagine it? Is there something else that we can do that can still have that? And it would be, I, I would I would I would say to people that it would it would be a I would write one version that would be the two hundred million dollar version, <laughs> and then I would go okay now what's the twenty dollar version that still has those essences of what it's in there that still has what that grand imagination if I had all the money if I had the money of James Cameron what would I do 
And now I don't have that, but what is the essence of that that I could make for the little money that we do have that could still make it work? And for the most part, I think that we we accomplished that. There is there's some bigger ideas that we would have probably not gone if we pushed for the lower budget version of it. Right, right. Yeah, neat technique to keep in mind for other filmmakers. Yeah. Uh, well, we got to wrap this up. Um, Nikki, uh, Fred, Gabriel, thank you for being here. Do you have uh, anything you want to add that I didn't ask you? One uh, last comment or maybe, uh, Nikki, I'll start with you. A takeaway from this experience? Uh, Do you learn anything? You yeah, say? I mean, it was a great experience. Um, you know, we went through the script and said we can do this. We didn't know it was going to take this long to do, um, but we finished it and we got it done. So I would just tell people, you know, if you have a project you want to do, don't worry about the time. Like you will finish it. It will get there and just stick with it. Kudos to your uh, stick to itness and determination. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Frederick, uh, any last words? Um, hey, kids, take a marketing class <laughs> along with the acting classes. <laughs> I guess that's appropriate, right? It is show business, the business of show business. Uh, well, and what about you? Uh, did you learn anything about yourself or any uh, come away with anything yourself on this? No, I think you froze. Yeah, yeah. you froze. Gabriel, oh, no, there you are. You're back. Fred? Right. <laughs> Fred, any, uh, any takeaways? Uh, anything learned? Did I? Oh, you froze. We must not have heard you. Another, yeah. Okay. Ugh, again with this. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. All right. We'll just we'll end with Gabriel. Thanks, Gabriel, Gabriel. What's, it, what's, it, what's anything you learned about yourself from filmmaking, or anything you want to just to take away? I think it's just uh, what I want to say. Thank you for for playing the film. I really do appreciate that. That means the world to to me uh, uh, and to to us, the whole filmmaking team. Um, and second, I wanted to just call out like uh, um, that though they couldn't be on on the call. You know, Zach Salzman, who did the cinematography for almost the entire film, um, which was an unbelievable uh, you know uh, um, amount of support for it. As well as um, the other main key to it was uh, um, both both Brent Beath, who did our unit production managing, and Simon Smith, who did the score, um, was just a miracle worker and brought that we had wanted a grand orchestral score, but obviously we can't get a John Williams type thing. And he brought that to it. And that the, the partnerships that we made with, with all of these keys that really put this together was unbelievable. And, you know, really made it something that, you know, I, I, it, more than I could have ever imagined it to be. So I think the take, the, the, my, my main takeaway was that, you know, allowing those that are great partners in it to kind of do their thing and people like Nikki and Fred and Simon, they really did, make this film way more than I could have ever imagined it to be. And so I'm just more just, you know, just so uh, grateful for all for all of them for, for their work on it. They've really made it what it is. Well, we're grateful you stuck to it and made this film too. Uh, not only that you just, you know, made this film, that's an accomplishment, quite an accomplishment uh, that you uh, submitted to our film festival and uh, are allowing us to show because we love it. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you playing it. We really do. Yeah. And uh, I hope I meet you guys in person someday. If you're ever in San Francisco, uh, look me up. Absolutely. All right, guys. Be well. And we'll see you at the movies. All right. Thanks.